Guru devotion is not some weird fanatical practice that you surrender yourself to the Guru and you do whatever they say. That's not Guru devotion. That's what I've been talking about for a long, long time. Guru devotion is surrendering yourself to yourself. Surrendering yourself to yourself is Guru devotion. And you see a lot of these advanced practitioners who have been practicing for 10, 20 years, they realize that point. And we need to learn that point because you know why we need to learn it from these advanced practitioners? Because it will save us a lot of headache and time, time wastage. Why is it when we don't trust ourselves, we don't trust our teachers? Why is it not trusting our teachers makes us not trust ourselves? What's the interconnection here? And that's what this beautiful lady, Pam, explores. And she came in her journey. And I find it very, very, very beautiful. Her writing was very touching. It was very touching because the meaning is quite deep. It's not deep simply because its meaning is something that this lady, I feel, has realized. What she has realized in a nutshell is surrendering to your guru is not surrendering to a person. It is surrendering to yourself. And those who have fear of surrendering to their guru have fear from themselves. Why is that? When we have unresolved issues with power, we feel that this person is taking away our freedom, that they don't allow us to do this and that and that and this and this, and, they, and they're, they're really critical and, they, and they, they judge us and they don't allow us to do these things. Actually, it's not our gurus allowing this with us. It's our own unresolved issues with power. You see, we come from societies all over the world that there are issues, that you can do this, you cannot do that, you can do that, you cannot do this. But those do, rules don't apply here. Why don't they apply here? Those are simply rules to make a country run well or a family run well or a business run well. But those are rules just for temporary benefit. The rules that your guru is talking about is not rules made up by man, is not rules made up by a country or by an institution. It is universal rules for every sentient being that is natural and abiding and constant. Example, not killing, not stealing, not lying, not taking your temper out on others to hurt them, not having a, a selfish temperamental mind. Those are not rules made up by man. It's not made up by God. It's not made up by a Buddha. It's not made up by a Lama or, or people or an institution. It is universal, natural law for everybody who abides and resides in a universe who wants happiness. And that's what we need to realize. So when we have authority figure power issues with our boss telling us what to do with society or whatever, we have these big issues. They don't apply to Dharma. So we shouldn't project those onto a Dharma teacher or to Dharma situations. Whereas, oh, if they say, oh, you can't drink this, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you shouldn't get all frustrated and flustered and worried. Why? It is not the same rules as the outside rules. So people say, oh, I'm afraid to take refuge vows. I'm afraid to take refuge. There's all these rules I can't follow. And I find it quite interesting because it shows me clearly that they still equate those with some kind of power figure or something about losing your freedom. You don't lose your freedom. When you abide by natural universal law, of compassion and forgiveness and tolerance and acceptance. You don't lose your freedom at all. In fact, you gain it. It is intolerance that make us not free and make us locked in. It is not accepting that make us locked in and narrow. It is not following the rules that make us lose our freedom. The Buddha is free. So in fact, that's a power issue that we shouldn't project onto others. Ambitions. We think that, we think that if we enter the Dharma, we're going to end up coming back looking like Lim Tat Meng. <laughs> Underweight, wearing tired little blue Dharma t-shirts with Omani Pemeho on them, no hair, looking like a skeleton, hanging out in some weird third world country in the forest pretending he's an Arhat that we can't make money, that we can't have a nice house or a nice car and we can't have nice things and nice friends. No! What Lim Tat Meng does and what you do has no difference if the motivation is correct. We can be, we can be enlightened sitting inside a, a BMW. 
We can be enlightened sitting in the middle of a forest. You think His Holiness runs around? You think His Holiness the Dalai Lama runs around, you know, being escorted here and there in a Ford Chevrolet from 1969? I don't think so. Black, black stretched limos. But he's enlightened. We can be enlightened inside a BMW. We can be enlightened in a cave. So what Lim Tat Meng does and other people do, it actually doesn't make any difference if the motivation is correct. So when we feel that, hey, if we practice the Dharma, we have to give up our ambitions. We can't have a nice house. We cannot ever have tongue licking again. <laughs> and Kachara House proved that wrong. <laughs> I encourage it. Get a blood test and lick all you want. <laughs> Got to be politically correct these days. Take a blood test first before you lick them. So we think that if we do Dharma, we have issues with ambition. That's going to ruin our ambition. That we can't study. That we can't be who we want to be. We can't, we can't you know, open up shop. We can't do business. We can't have a nice car. We can't have a nice family. We, can't have, we cannot not, not have a nice family. We got to be this way. We got to be that way. We got to be that way. We got to be this way. You know, all these issues come up. So we're afraid. We're afraid to surrender to our guru. We're afraid to surrender to the Dharma. But you see, surrendering to your guru, surrendering to Dharma has nothing to do with giving up your lifestyle. Has nothing to do with that. It's never been about that. It's never been. That's why you see great Mahasiddhas in the past. They were born as princes and lived in great palaces, great kings, great masters. They lived as, you know, the servants, the courtesans. They lived as kings. They lived as courtesans. They lived as beggars. They were everyone who became enlightened in different parts of society, in different aspects of society. Because it's not about giving up your lifestyle. That's why if we study the Mahasiddha lineage and stories, it's very beautiful. Because they come from all types of backgrounds. Some are bird catchers or were. Some are just gluttons. They sit there and think about food all day. Oh, yes. There's one Mahasiddha. He's called the glutton, literally. He became enlightened, though. He ate food and became enlightened. We ate food and we end up in the gym. Big difference. All right, so hope of giving up, it has nothing to do with that. Then some people have issues that, oh, you know, if I practice Dharma, I can't have love. I can't have love. I can't have a relationship. Who I sleep with, how I sleep, when I sleep, and, and, and what I do when I'm sleeping with someone is dictated by the Buddha. So I don't, I don't want to surrender myself to that. I don't want to surrender to this because I lose my freedom of sensual pleasure. That's also wrong. Look at all these tantric deities. They all have their lovers. Every tantric deity. The highest, in fact, they're the highest tantric deities. They all have lovers what? They're always in union. They're looking at you because they're in great bliss. Very happy. Oh, don't see any here. No, not here. So, oh yeah, over there. All these, all these tantric deities. So what am I trying to say? You don't give up love. Oh, I can't have a relationship. A relationship will be evil. I'm not holy if I look for a relationship. If I, if I look for a relationship and I want a relationship, I keep a relationship, it's against Buddha's teachings. No. No. Definitely not. Definitely not. And then what kind of relationship? Can I have a man? Can I have a, a woman? Can I have something in between? Can I have neither? Can I do it with an animal? Look, if it doesn't hurt the other being, that's what you should think about. If it doesn't hurt the other person. I'm not here propagating or, or um, being a poster boy for illicit abnormal sex here. I'm not trying to be poster boy here. I'm trying to tell you the motivation is the factor. Look, once you leave this room, all of you, okay, except one, two, three, oh, four, five, um, six, won't have bubbly. But everybody else will. Everybody else will. But just because you're not having bubbly doesn't mean that if you think about it, it's not the same. What's more negative, to kill one person or to sit there and meditate on killing a thousand every day and thinking how, 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 I'm plotting and praying, I want to kill a thousand. Think. So just because you don't engage in, in bubbly, all right, let me say it, sex, doesn't mean you're holy and smoly and the, and the rainbows come out of your lower regions. <laughs> and just because you engage in sex doesn't mean the rainbows stop coming out from your lower regions.
other things come out too, but rainbows too. It has nothing to do with that. So what am I encouraging? Go out and have sex? No. Be yourself. Be yourself. You have a body. It has needs. It needs to eat. It needs to sleep. It needs to rest. So if you sleep, it's bad karma? No. But if you're always sleepy, it's bad karma. Why? It arises from bad karma. It's a distraction for your practice. But sleeping is not bad karma. If you're eating, is it bad karma? No. Of course you need to eat. You've got a human body. You've got to eat. You need petrol. And then your body has other needs. It has fevers. It needs Panadol. It builds up. It has some natural regenerative procreative forces in it. That's, you know, from, from you know, aeons ago. So all these are very natural. But it's your motivation behind it. So if I do dharma, if I surrender to my guru, if I take refuge, I can't have sex anymore. No. No. I don't want to get into big details about it. It's not unnecessary. But no, that's not the point. You don't have to stop. You don't have to change. You don't have to alter. What you have to do is not harm. So if in Buddhism, or in, in Buddhism, in Buddhism, and then in, in the higher law of human relations, and in, in the universal law, if we have a partner, and we've sworn to our partner, and we do things outside of our partner's knowledge and hurt our partner, no one needs to tell you that's good or bad. If it creates pain, it's bad. If it creates pain and it's bad, then the pain will come back to you. That's law. What we call yin guo in Chinese, right? In Tibetan, lian jie. Le da jibu. Karma and its effects. So it's not like your guru tells you, oh, it's bad, you know, it's bad. You can't, you can't have 25 affairs, you know, it's very bad, bad, bad. Whether guru tells you not, you should know that. If you didn't know that, you wouldn't be doing secretly, would you? You wouldn't go to JP's 69 hotel and rent it for two hours, a room. You wouldn't. So is that criticism? No, it's not. So having fear of engaging in Dharma practice to be told that, you shouldn't be afraid. Why? You already know that. You already know. But what you need to know is its effects and how it comes about and why we do it and understand it. To understand it and to come to terms with it. So when we understand and come to terms with it, we stop doing it not because we go to hell. We stop doing it not because we're some holy moly Buddhist and we're taking refuge. We, don't, we stop doing it because we went to Burma. You know, it's none of that. We stop doing it because our mind has realized it doesn't bring any benefit. So why waste our time? So when we engage in Buddhist practice or surrender to a guru, we have that fear. We lose our sexual freedom. We don't. But we lose our freedom to create harm by sex. That's what we lose. You know how we lose it? Because the guru tells you no. Because Buddha tells you no, no. Because the Buddha tells you why. And the guru translate that for you in today's terms. And then you think about it and say, yeah, it's true. I mean, a lot of things in life we stop doing because we found out it's harmful. You know, we look at surveys and studies. We listen to the doctors. We listen to our friends. Go, oh, yeah, if we do that, it's harmful, huh? And we stop. We stop not because it's sinful, because it's harmful. I mean, who wants asbestos in their seedlings now? In the 60s and 70s, it was very big. It's cheap. It's easy. But we found out later everybody gets lung cancer. I was breathing as asbestos in my school in New Jersey for eight years. Then later, 10, 15 years later, they say, oh, guess what? You're going to get lung cancer. I'm like, oh, thank you very much. So now people don't use this. It's not good or bad karma. So why don't we think about it like that? Abstaining from sex or having sex is, is like asbestos. Think of it like that. Why think of it like that? Because that's what it's all about. I'm demystifying it for you. See, I don't like religions and I don't like teachers and people that put you down and harm you and slap you down and tell you you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, and don't question it. I don't like that. Do you know why I don't like it? Because telling me that doesn't help me to change. It adds more guilt to me. And people express guilt differently. Some people do more. Some people don't care anymore. Some people do it, they don't feel good. Anything. So guilt doesn't help. It doesn't help. So therefore, we have that fear. Then we have fear, um, love, that we can't have relationships. Of course we can have relationships. What do you think? Once you become a Buddhist, you take refuge, or you're doing Buddhist practices, or you can't, you know, you can't have it anymore? You see, in Christianity, they say that marriage and a man and woman joining is very sacred, and it's in the eyes of God and blah, 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 whatever, all that stuff. In Buddhism, they don't highlight that in weddings. 
There are Buddhist weddings. There are ceremonies for, for people getting married. The thing is this, it's not that it's good or bad. It's not that it's opposite. In Buddhism, the focus is not about money. It's not about marriage. It's not about relations. It's not about any of that. If those things help you, go ahead and do it. It's about finding yourself. So Buddhist teachings highlight more the deeper inner teachings of human awareness. It doesn't focus on those. It has those. Of course, it has marriage ceremonies. Of course, I've conducted Buddhist weddings before. I've given them the vows. Of course there is, but it's not about that. So in Christianity, for some Christianity, some Christian practitioners, not all, some, that's the epitome. That's it, you know, in the eyes of God, blah, we get married, wear the dress, and blah, oh, we go to the temple, I'm, I'm sorry, to the church, and that's it. Nothing else beyond that. Well, what makes it so sacred if afterwards you're hating each other, cheating on each other, lying to each other?